Nature is healing, Ed. Hmm? <laughs> What's that? So nature is healing, Ed. A lot of exactly. Yeah.
Happy Monday. Okay, just a couple of items at the top. And I know there's a heart out here for a gather time, so we'll work to get through as many people as possible. And if our friends in the front row could help with that so we can get to the back row, we'll come circle back around if that works. Okay, a couple things at the top. Uh, as you all know, uh, the President is launching his Help Is Here tour to communicate directly with Americans about how the rescue plan is helping them and their families. The tour will make clear that help is here and that we're on the path towards crushing the virus and rebuilding our economy. A number of these pieces you know, but just to add a few more details. So tomorrow the President will travel to Delaware County, Pennsylvania to highlight how the rescue plan invests in small businesses, a key component of the package, including minority-owned businesses, so they can rehire and retain workers while keeping them safe. Uh, the Vice President and second, second Gentleman will be in Denver also meeting with small business owners. So that will be a big piece we're highlighting tomorrow. On Wednesday, the First Lady will travel to Concord, New Hampshire to underscore how the American Rescue Plan provides $130 billion to help schools reopen. The second gentleman will convene a listening session in Albuquerque, New Mexico with working women, including teachers. And Education Secretary Cardona will do a remote local media tour to talk about school reopenings. And I think you can see what the theme is of that day. Uh, on Thursday, the administration will showcase how the American Rescue Plan provides emergency aid to cover back rent, help home homeowners catch up on their payments, and provide funding for families recovering from homelessness. And then on Friday, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris will Travis to travel to Georgia, as you all already know, to underscore how they and congressional Democrats fulfilled their promise in delivering $1,400 checks to finish the job of $2,000 in direct relief to millions of Americans. Uh, the second piece of just the last piece, I should say, at the top is many of you saw the news out this morning uh, that Gene Sperling uh, will be joining the uh, team here to run point on the implementation of the rescue plan. I've known him for a long time. I worked with him previously, but to give you a few highlights, uh, Gene has spent more than a decade at the highest level of government, including a senior treasury official and as the only person to serve as NEC director twice. As we've talked about in bit, a bit in here, there are a number of economic uh, officials who will be playing roles in implementation. So he has uh, especially an interesting and relevant background in helping pull all those levers. Um, Gene was also uh, 
played a key role in helping steer Detroit out of bankruptcy and on the path to renewal, and he quarterbacks support for small businesses and economic assistance for unemployed Americans. Uh, he will work with the heads of White House policy councils and key leaders at federal agencies so we can get funds out the door quickly, maximize its impact, accelerate the work that the administration is doing to crush COVID and rescue our economy. Uh, and as I've noted in here before, the president felt it was important to have a point person who could, of course, pull all of these levers. With that, go ahead, Zeke. Thanks, Jen. Uh, millions of Americans started to receive direct deposit checks over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, has the president given any thought to how he wants Americans uh, to use that money? Does he particularly want them to spend it to stimulate the economy? Well, uh, that's an, a great question. I think that uh, the president believes that uh, this relief will help uh, Americans get through this difficult period of time, and uh, they will use it for uh, different means. Uh, some Americans will use it to ensure they can put food on the table. Uh, that certainly is a form of stimulus. Uh, some will use it to ensure they can pay their rent. That's also a form of stimulus. Uh, some will use it to um, you know, pay back some loans they may have taken out. It's it's really up to family to family. He wants them to have the discretion on how they're utilizing these funds. But he pushed for this additional fourteen hundred dollar check check uh, and was adamant about that because he knows people need a bridge to get to the other side of this economic downturn. On a different subject, the Vatican uh, uh, today said it would not bless same sex unions. Uh, the president's a devout Catholic. Does he have a, a personal response uh, to that? I don't think he has a personal response uh, to the Vatican, no. Uh, he continues to believe uh, and support same-sex unions, as you know, and he's long had that position. And then, uh, finally, uh, does, the, does the president, uh, the president's the head of the Democratic Party. What message is he sending by not calling on the New York governor um, to resign, number one? And number two, tomorrow is the usual weekly call with governors. Governor Cuomo is still the head of the National Governor mm -hmm. Association, usually attends. Is he still welcome on the White House convened call? Well, let me first say that, uh, like everyone who as continues to read stories, new developments seem to happen uh, every day. Uh, we find them troubling. The president finds them troubling, hard to read. Um, and uh, every woman uh, who steps forward needs to be treated with dignity uh, and respect. Uh, the New York Attorney General is uh, pursuing, of course, an independent investigation against Governor Cuomo, and that is appropriate. And the president believes that's appropriate, as is the vice president. Uh, the investigation needs to be both quick and thorough, consistent with how serious these allegations are. Uh, and of course, uh, our objective, though, here uh, continues to be to get the COVID pandemic under control. And we don't want the people of New York or any state uh, to uh, be impacted uh, negatively. We will continue to work with a range of governors, including Governor Cuomo, who I would expect would join the call tomorrow. Uh, we'll leave that up to him. But, uh, but in order to continue to coordinate on getting uh, the pandemic under control and economic assistance out the door. Uh, go ahead. Oh, we'll go to you, Steve, next. So go ahead. Uh, thanks. Just two quick ones. Jen, given how fast moving the, the situation has been, does the president believe the, that his administration has a handle on what's happening on the southern border right now? We certainly do. And let me just give you a bit of an update on a couple of the steps that um, we're taking. Um, you know, first, let me say that, um, like COVID, obviously a different issue, but uh, we recognize this is a big problem. Uh, the last administration. Uh, left us a dismantled uh, and unworkable system. And like any other problem, uh, we are going to do everything we can to solve it. Uh, so our focus here is on solutions. Let me just walk you through a couple of the steps. And we've done this a little bit, but there's always, of course, developments on um, considerations that are underway. Um, so first, um, we've updated, uh, or we have not, but CDC has updated guidelines to return to full capacity. This will help expand capacity to move children more quickly out of CBP facilities. That's an important step. The implementation of that is, of course, ongoing. Uh, we are, uh, there is there's now an embedding at the president's ask of HHS and ORR staff with CBP, uh, which will allow government to more quickly ID, vet, confirm sponsors and family members of the unaccompanied minors and will lead to quicker place because as you know, or as all as you know, big issues here are uh, expediting what's happening at the border. None of these border patrol facilities are made for children, and we want to move them as quickly as possible into shelters and then into homes. Uh, FEMA, this was a, uh, an announcement over the weekend, is now supporting, uh, providing support at the border, adding extra capacity to HHS for quick processing to avoid overcrowding. Uh, this will hope, we hope this will help quickly get children into HHS and ORR facilities and placed with vetted sponsors and families. 
president's very focused on expediting what's happening at the border at every step in the process. And then this happened on Friday, but it didn't receive a lot of, there was a lot going on. So I just wanted to highlight, um, we rescinded the 2018 MOU between DHS and HHS, which we believe will encourage families and sponsors to come forward uh, without fear of additional immigration enforcement. And we've seen this as an issue where uh, family members or even sponsor families are worried that this will mean they will be tracked and this uh, over, uh, rescinds that, um, that. We're also looking for additional facilities and this remains a focus. So uh, we recognize this is a problem. We're focused on addressing it. That's just five steps we're taking uh, and we're continuing to evaluate what additional steps can be taken to address the situation at the border. One more real quick. For the $130 billion in education funding, one of the big issues with past pots of ed funding is it will be obligated, but getting it spent takes mm -hmm. time. Will that be part of Gene's mandate, ensuring the money is not just obligated, but it actually goes out the door to, to make the fixes that these schools need to actually get students back into place? He'll absolutely be coordinating with the Secretary of uh, education secretary cardona who's going to be holding uh, an education summit soon uh, i believe it might be next week i'm not sure if they've announced it yet so hopefully i'm not getting ahead of them uh, and part of that is working with schools and school districts on identifying best practices and sharing them figuring out um, how to ensure that the schools who need funding get the funding there will be a requirement that uh, schools who get funding have to do a report within 30 days of uh, how they will reopen their schools so a big part of the implementation of course it will be led by the Department of Education, but that is a pivotal part of the rescue plan and one the Americans strongly support, and certainly uh, Gene would have a role in coordinating that. Go ahead. Jen, is, is Mexico doing enough to stem the flow of migrants across the territory? Across the territory from South America into, yeah. into Mexico? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we are we work extremely closely with the country of Mexico on uh, and on addressing what is a challenge for us and certainly a challenge for them. There's always more that can be done, uh, Steve. And I think part of our engagement is having those diplomatic conversations and uh, having discussions about uh, what more can be done at, at all the borders. And separately, on North Korea, have you reached out to them to try to engage in dialogue, and have they responded in any way? I know there were some reports um, over the weekend on exactly that, uh, and so I can confirm that we have reached out. We obviously have a main uh, series of a number of channels, as, as we always have had, that we can reach out through. Um, we also are focused on consulting with many former government officials who have been involved in North Korea policy, including from several uh, prior administrations. And we have and will continue to engage with other Japanese and South Korean allies to solicit input, explore fresh approaches. Uh, we've listened carefully to their ideas, including through trilateral consultations. Our goal is, of course, diplomacy is always our goal. Uh, our goal is to reduce the risk of escalation. Uh, but uh, to date, we have not received any response. Are you surprised by that, that they haven't responded? Well, Steve, as you know, because you follow this issue closely, and I know and have covered past administration, this follows over a year without active dialogue uh, with North Korea, uh, despite multiple attempts by the U.S. to engage. Uh, so diplomacy remains our, uh, continues to remain our first priority. Uh, we have, uh, I think you can all anticipate that there will be a continued uh, expansion of engagement with partners and allies in the region, and this will, of course, be a top a topic of discussion. Go ahead. Yes. Um, can you bottom line for us again? What is the what is the hope and expectation from this help is here toward this week? Uh, the, over the next couple of days, uh, a big focus is we want to uh, take a moment or take some time, more than a moment, to engage directly with the American people and make sure they understand the benefits of the package, how they can benefit from the package, and how it's going to help them uh, get through this uh, difficult period of time in our economy and our economic recovery, and also give them a sense of uh, how we're going to use it to help address the pan pandemic. We recognize that signing the bill is just a first step and getting the money out the door, ensuring people know how they can benefit, how it will help their local communities is an important part as well. Fair to say you're trying to shore up the strong support for the law as it already exists. Well, I would say the bill is already quite positive. Um, and so, but what the president recognizes from his own experience uh, is that 
uh, when it's a, a package of this size, um, you know, people don't always know how they benefit and how, what it means for them. And uh, last week I was talking to him about one of the pieces of the package, the, the checks, and he asked me to explain to him, how do you explain to people how checks get out the door? So this is what's on his mind, right? How do people know how this money will help their schools? You know, how do they know, um, you know, how this will help get vaccines in the arms of their friends and family members? And he believes the American people uh, deserve every high-level person from our administration out there explaining, discussing, taking input, and that's what his team will be doing. So while he does that, you know, there are a lot of Americans who see him going to take these trips this week to promote this popular law and think, okay, but why can't he take time to go down to the border? You know, you said last week, and you've said before, it takes a lot of resources to get him there. It's taking a lot of resources to get him to Pennsylvania and Georgia this week, the vice mm -hmm. president out west. Why not take the time to schedule something to go there as well? Well, I would say, Ed, that his focus is on developing solutions, pushing his team, encouraging his team to develop solutions that will expedite processing at the border, that will open more facilities, that will ensure kids are treated with humanity and also treated safely, uh, and that's his focus. Um, and so that's where he's putting his, uh, his efforts on immigration. And what is the status of allowing cameras into some of these facilities. We've been asking for weeks about whether or not the press will ever get a chance to see either the Border Patrol mm -hmm. or the HHS facilities. We continue uh, to support transparency uh, and from here from the White House and uh, DHS oversees some of the facilities, HHS oversees some of the facilities. I know that they're working through uh, how to uh, provide access in a way that is uh, abides by COVID protocols and also protects the privacy of people who are being, uh, who are staying in those facilities. Just oh, one, one Cuomo thing. Mm -hmm. um, has the president himself spoken to the governor? No. Has anyone here at the White House spoken to the governor? Not that I'm aware of, no. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. First, a question about workplace safety. OSHA is up against the deadline set by President Biden to uh, decide whether or not there need to be emergency temporary standards for uh, COVID-19 safety mm -hmm. for the next six months. Is there any concern that additional federal regulations might and the cost of complying with them might be a burden on businesses already trying to or already struggling to survive? Well, first, the president signed an executive order, which I know you're familiar with, but back maybe the third day he was in office mm -hmm. uh, because he um, wants to ensure um, that workers are, of course, safe. Uh, he's asked the American people to do their part to help quickly beat the virus, and he has directed OSHA to determine if any emergency, if an emergency temporary standard was necessary to protect workers from COVID. So his objective is actually to protect workers and members of the work force. Um, the OSHA has been working diligently, but we, of course, um, believe we, they should have the time to get it right and time to ensure it's right. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we're waiting for them to, to make a conclusion. And as the voice of the White House, uh, would it, how hard would it be to convince people in some states that are trying to open up quickly that there are new federal rules that they need to follow instead? Well, there are no new federal rules yet. Um, we will let OSHA put out their guidelines, and then, of course, we will work to ensure that people understand why and that they support uh, workers being safe, which I think even many owners of businesses would support. And then on immigration, does FEMA's arrival at the border mean that the administration feels what is happening down at the border is a disaster? I know that we always get into the fun of labels around here, but I would say our focus is on solutions, and this is one of the steps that the president felt would help uh, uh, not become a final solution, but help expedite processing, help ensure that uh, people who are coming across the border are have access to health and medical care. Clearly, the numbers are enormous. This is a big challenge, uh, and it certainly is a reflection of using every lever of the federal government to help address that. FEMA, though, specifically, their mission is helping people before, during, and after disasters. We've heard you say that it's a problem, that it's a challenge. Is it now a disaster? I appreciate the opportunity. I do like your mask. Um, but I will say that um, FEMA is uh, there to help uh, ensure that the people who are at the border, who are coming across the border, uh, have access to uh, can to HHS and ORR shelters, that we can swiftly 
place them with vetted families. They're, are, they're playing a number of roles uh, there uh, to address what we feel is a significant problem and a significant challenge. And I think we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, step, been hiding about that. And then just a quick final one. Uh, DHS said that the FEMA plan for 90 days would be to receive, shelter, and transfer unaccompanied children. Does that mean that the federal government now is moving beyond the message from the last couple weeks, which was now is not the time to come? No, we are cons we are we are we are doing both, um, and uh, it's a complicated problem, no doubt about it. We are sending the message clearly in the region. Now is not the time to come, but also we want to ensure that people are treated with humanity, uh, who are children, who are unaccompanied children. Uh, that's who we are as a country, and so we are doing both. Uh, go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Hey, given what we're saying at uh, state legislatures in terms of tightening voting restrictions, mm -hmm. some groups are saying that the White House should consider reprioritizing voting rights over infrastructure. Is that something that's under consideration here at the White House, to reprioritize and, and focus on voting rights next, uh, now that the, the uh, ARP is out? Well, first I would say that um, HR1, as you all know, has passed the House. Um, S S1, I believe, will be uh, I think put forward officially later this week, or that's what reports suggest. We are working closely with uh, senators who we've engaged directly with on this, uh, with uh, with uh, staff, uh, and we are very deeply engaged in working with members of the Senate and their teams on how this can move forward. I wouldn't say one is over the other. Uh, voting rights and ensuring uh, people have access to voting, that it is easier, not harder, is a core priority for the president. Uh, that's why he's, his team is so engaged in this process. And of course, investing in infrastructure, ensuring that uh, we can create good, uh, clean energy, union jobs is also a priority. Uh, you have to walk and chew gum as president of the United States, and certainly he believes both are imperative and important. And then on infrastructure, would any, are, is there concern that any tax increases on the, and, and, as related to the package would, that, that, that would slow down economic growth at all? Well, there isn't a package yet. Right. Uh, I know there's lots of conversations in, in Congress, and we're certainly working very closely uh, with them and consultations. And obviously, uh, the president will have more to say about what he wants to pursue next as part of his Build Back Better agenda. Uh, the president remains committed to his pledge from the campaign that nobody uh, making uh, under $400,000 a year uh, will have uh, their taxes increased. His priority and focus has always been on people paying their fair share. Uh, and also uh, focusing on corporations that may not be paying their fair share either. So that remains his overarching uh, approach, uh, but there isn't a package yet where we're talking about pay-fors yet. So I expect we can have more conversations about that down the road. Go ahead. Jen, thanks. Two questions. One, the Treasury Secretary said yesterday that a wealth tax is something you haven't decided on yet and can look at. Mm -hmm. Is that on the table as an approach to pay for some of the next round of plans from the President? Uh, well, the, I know Senator Warren has put forward a wealth tax, um, and the president shares uh, her view that middle class families are paying more than their fair share, and those at the top are not doing uh, their part. So certainly he has a, that uh, shared objective. He laid out during the campaign his own plans for fixing this, which are different from Senator Warren's. But certainly, as we get to the point about discussing uh, taxes and tax reform uh, or reforms of the tax system, that uh, they share an objective. But is that, just to be clear, the se Treasury Secretary said it was something you haven't decided on yet. Is that accurate? That well, well, I think it's ha how to pursue it. What I'm conveying is that uh, there is a shared uh, view that those at the top are not doing their part. Obviously, that corporations uh, could be paying higher taxes. That continues to be consistent with what the president talked about. He had a different proposal he put forward than the one Senator Warren has put forward. But, you know, as, as is always the case with democracy in action, when it's the appropriate time, I'm sure they'll discuss and he will discuss with others what their views are of how to address this moving forward. And then also, the EU uh, is starting legal action against the United Kingdom for not honoring Brexit conditions. Does the U.S. support this action, and is the president particularly concerned given his um, support for the Good Friday Agreement? Yeah. Let me see if I have something on this for you, and if not, I'm happy to get something for you after the briefing. Um, we continue to encourage both the European Union and the U.K. government to prioritize pragmatic uh, solutions to safeguard and advance the hard-won peace in no Northern Ireland. Uh, we would, of course, encourage you to speak to those governments directly about any 
legal actions. Uh, President Biden has been unequivocal in his support for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Uh, this agreement has been the bedrock of peace, stability, and prosperity for all the people of Northern Ireland. And we also welcome cooperation between our British and Irish counterparts on the Northern Irish Porter Protocol. Go ahead, Hans. Um, just quick housekeeping one. Sure. When does, when does Jean start? Hmm. Let me see what I have here for you. He's currently, I do know he's currently in California, and so he'll be re working remotely for a period of time until he um, has his vaccine. Uh, let me see if I have a timeline for him. I'll check on that for you, Hans. Uh, just a quick follow-up, and maybe mm -hmm. I'm too, but will he be in the West Wing or the EEOB? <laughs> Where will his office be? Yes. Uh, well, he will be wor working remotely for some period of time. He, his title will be White House American Rescue Plan Coordinator and Senior Advisor to the President. Try to fit that on a card. I don't know. Um, long one, but impressive. Um, he'll work out of the White House and have a team working with him. In terms of where his office will be, I'm not sure that's been formally determined quite yet. Okay, and then uh, you know Zeke's question is sort of: Does the president have any opinions or sort of thoughts on how Americans should be spending that they're getting their stimulus checks? More broadly speaking, all this money is going to be coursing through states and localities mm -hmm. and cities. Does the president have any sort of preferences? Does he have any red lines? What they shouldn't do? If there are any tax cuts, would that bother him? How is he thinking about the money once it goes out the door to states and localities? Well, the original purpose of the state and local funding was to keep cops, firefighters, other essential employees um, at, uh, at work and employed. And it wasn't intended to cut taxes. Uh, so I think he certainly hopes that uh, that's how the funding is used. But part of the impl implementation of it will be under the purview of our soon to be starting uh, coordinator uh, and senior advisor to the president. And uh, I'm sure he'll be focused on that. You know, money's coming into states and localities, and, and in some cases it hasn't been as disastrous as it was maybe earlier thought it might be, and the shortfall isn't as great. Some of the states and localities could find themselves with surpluses. And so I guess what you're saying here is that the president and Gene, by extension, would be opposed to any tax cuts that any states or localities would pass through, that they'd rather have it be more on the building front or more on the hiring front. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? Well, I think the intention, as we've long talked about, uh, was to keep people in their jobs and their roles. If there's our, uh, like cops and firefighters and others, uh, if there are surpluses, I'll have to talk to our NEC team if there's, if what considerations they have uh, for that particular issue. Go ahead. Thank you, um, appreciate it. Um, just circling back to um, Governor Cuomo, the Washington Post reported on Sunday that a top Cuomo advisor, who also happens to be New York's vaccine czar, um, called county officials to gauge their loyalty to Cuomo um, amid his sexual harassment investigation. Um, I wanted to see if uh, the president is concerned that vaccine distribution in New York has become politicized. And is the administration taking any steps to make sure that political favoritism is not tainted, um, is not tainting access to vaccine for New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. Well, first, let me say we all read those stories. One was in your outlet. There are a, no a number of other stories uh, out there. Um, and certainly, we found them um, concerning uh, about uh, this inappropriate reported behavior. There are a number of checks in the system, I will say. Um, the CDC has the ability to track and monitor distribution. And we've talked about this a little bit before as it relates to uh, equitable distribution of vaccine supply. And so every vaccine box is tracked and we know where it's going and uh, the CDC can track that and monitor. And if there are, uh, you know, we work uh, to ensure that um, it is equitably distributed and that there are not steps that are taken that are uh, concerning. The other piece is that we work uh, with local health officials across the state, right? We work with officials, uh, you know, who are who are uh, overseeing distribution in all of the different cities, localities, uh, to ensure uh, that they are getting what they need, that uh, there are no breaks in the system, and we are engaged across the board, especially in a state like New York, and we uh, certainly track any concerns. Uh, that come up. Um, so, you know, there we were concerned, of course, about the reports of this inappropriate behavior, uh, but we also have a number of steps that are already in the system uh, to ensure that the people of New York, the people of any state, um, you know, um, are getting the, the vaccines distributed, distributed fairly and equitably. So given those reports over the weekend, 
did you take any extra steps to take another look, at, especially at New York? Because the allegation is quite concerning, I would think, for not only on New Yorkers, but all Americans. Uh, of course, we are constantly monitoring. I'm not. I'm. I've not been made aware of any incidents that uh, that uh, that have been raised in per, in relation to this report. Um, there are regular reports out of states that we take a look at, even before this report. But uh, if there is, I can see with our team if there's anything new as it relates to this report from this weekend. And then also, um, you know, on Cuomo, just following up for an earlier question, it's our understanding that Governor Cuomo not just he doesn't merely participate in these calls, these COVID calls, but he is in fact, a, a leads them is a, and is a, a big um, player in terms of organizing them. And so uh, we're curious if the president has any concerns with that, with his sort of level of leadership over this critical piece in, um, of, you know, the COVID response. Well, it would be up to the NGA to determine if they were to make a change on that front. It's also up to the legislature and others in New York to determine uh, if they're, uh, if he still has the confidence of the people in the state. Uh, but our focus from here, from the federal government, is of course supporting that independent investigation, which we adamantly do, uh, but also working with governors across the country, uh, with the NGA, with the DGA, with others, to address issues that come up uh, or, or hear from them and listen to them and work with them on COVID and addressing COVID, getting the pandemic under control, et cetera. And we will continue to work with a range of governors across the country. Under the Trump administration, it was not set up this way. My understanding is under, under the Trump administration, um, Vice President Pence was doing these weekly calls. And this has been a shift to go from Pence to somebody like um, Governor Cuomo at this point. So I'm wondering if perhaps the White House wants to shift it back towards the White House or away from the NGA, which happens to be led by a governor who has a lot of things going on in the state at the moment. Well, one of the reasons that it's been set up uh, to engage directly with governors is that uh, there were um, operational aspects of the way the last administration approached COVID and a approached COVID, the distribution of vaccines or approached planning and engagement with governors that wasn't working. Uh, they didn't feel they had the information they needed. They didn't know when they were getting vaccine supply. And our effort was to work much more directly uh, in a range of means, uh, in a range of ways, up and down the ranks in these states to ensure that we were addressing the local needs as they came up. So I'm, I'm not aware of any plan to shift that approach. Comfortable with Cuomo essentially leading these weekly calls? Again, this is up to, uh, I think he's in that position because he is head of the NGA. Uh, and it's up to the NGA to determine if that's where they want to see things moving forward. Just quickly on immigration, um, given uh, the FEMA deployment to the border, I wanted to see if the administration um, is going to ask Congress for any additional emergency money to secure the border or fund resources um, to house or provide additional care for, for children who are there. Uh, the, the, the problems is I've, uh, one, there's an immigration bill that we've certainly proposed um, that we hope that uh, members of both parties will take seriously and engage in a, in a constructive conversation about. Uh, the issues uh, and challenges we're facing uh, are not fully, are not solely about funding at all, um, but I'm not aware of additional requests for immediate funding. I'm happy to check on that as well. And then one, one absolute last question um, about the, um, uh, this is uh, related to some appointments at the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my colleague Nancy Cook of uh, Bloomberg News wrote a story last week, I believe, noting that liberal groups um, are growing concerned that there are a number of attorneys who are being appointed to top positions who have a background of defending large companies, including um, connections to Apple and Facebook. Um, and these groups are asking that some of these attorneys recuse themselves in matters of anti in antitrust matters. I'm just wondering if the administration or the White House shares that concern and is considering asking them to recuse themselves on some of these larger big tech antitrust matters that will be coming up, presumably. I'd have to look at it more closely. It may be a decision for the Department of Justice to make, but I will look more closely and see if we have a view from the White House about recusals. Thanks. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead in the back. Go ahead in the back. Thank you very much, Jane. A uh, quick uh, follow-up on the border. Does President Biden plan to visit the border? I don't have any trips to preview for you at this point in time. If we do, we will certainly preview them. Something he's considering or talking about? I don't have anything to preview for you. Okay, going back to the, uh, the vaccine. I know you say the goal is to vaccinate Americans first, but I want to go back to the AstraZeneca supply sitting here in the U.S. without approval. Mm -hmm. 
uh, many countries are seeking, Brazil is uh, also seeking access to the supply. Brazil is in urgent need. Um, scientists around the world are saying that Brazil is a threat to the world right now, the situation there, the crisis there. Dr. Dr. Fauci said last week that the most important thing to do in Brazil is to get more people vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, but Brazil is struggling. So, uh, would the uh, when can we expect that these countries that need it in, uh, right now and can use right now because they have the approval there, when can we expect they can have access to, to maybe this supply, maybe in June or July? Can you? When? Well, we are engaged with a range of countries, I'm, I'm certain with Brazil as well, about their requests. Um, and we are, of course, focused, the President is focused on ensuring that all Americans, uh, all adult Americans are vaccinated. That's. Uh, the first objective here, uh, but we are uh, looking forward to being, uh, you know, players in the global community is effort to address the global pandemic. There was a significant amount announcement made on Friday coming out of the Quad Summit about supply that we have agreed to uh, to work with the Quad members to provide to uh, a range of countries and regions. And we are so, certainly open to discussing and considering, um, you know, when we can provide additional supply. But I don't have anything to preview for you or predict in terms of the timeline. Which we're going to have to just go on because we, we're, otherwise we're not going to get to everybody. Go ahead. Um, so a new poll from NPR and Marist said that nearly half of Republican men won't get the vaccine when it's available to them. And, and I know that last week you said that the Democratic administration might not always be the best messenger to communicate to everyone kind of the importance and the benefits of getting the vaccine. Um, and so I just wanted to ask if the White House is making plans to try to boost Republican receptivity to the vaccine. And can you share what any of those ideas are? Sure. Um, First, the president's goal is to vaccinate all Americans, not just those who voted for him. Uh, right now, the phase we're in is that demand for the vaccine still outstrips supply. Uh, we won't be in that phase forever, but right now the big issue is access and people wanting to have access to the vaccine. And so we're focusing on how to make it as convenient and accessible for Americans as possible. And I talked about this very briefly last week, uh, but uh, we know we need to meet uh, everyone where they are, and that includes uh, conservatives um, uh, and ensure there are trusted messengers who lead the way in those engagements. Uh, 81 percent of Republicans said they would trust their own doctor or health care provider in some polling that came out this weekend to provide reliable information about a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, you know, this is consistent with what I was conveying last week and some of the data that we've seen internally about how, yes, there are a number of prominent officials out there who, if they were more vocal about getting the vaccine, we'd certainly support that. But also doctors and local health care providers are, we see poll after poll, are, are the most, one of the most trusted authorities in communities, regardless of people's political affiliation, as are religious leaders um, and uh, local uh, leaders uh, as well. So we are very mindful of that and thinking of ways to uh, support, empower, uh, you know, help fund uh, those efforts. Uh, we're also meeting regularly with conservative groups, faith leaders, and rural stakeholders to partner with partner with them in boosting vaccine confidence. But I also have a couple of examples that I found interesting. Hopefully you do as well. Uh, you know, we are focused on earned media and establishing partnerships with trusted messengers right now. We will quickly move to a public, a big public campaign, which will be run out of HHS. There's even some funding in the American Rescue Plan for that. That will be a part of it that hopefully we'll have more to say on in a couple of weeks. But uh, some a couple of examples. Tomorrow, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins will be hosting an event with evangelical leaders to discuss the vaccine and how we can partner with them. Uh, Dr. Collins uh, has appeared on the 700 Club. Uh, we also have done, of course, a range of engagements with different vac uh, communities where there's vaccine hesitancy. Dr. Nina Smith on The Shade Room. Dr. Fauci did an interview with Gloria Stefan, mm -hmm. which now I want to go find and watch myself, as I'm sure many of you do. Uh, so we are trying to be creative mm -hmm. on earned media to meet people where they are, but we're also mindful of empowering, supporting um, local trusted voices mm -hmm. because we've seen that in poll after poll to be uh, an effective way of reaching a range of communities. And Dr. Fauci said uh, recently that former President Trump getting involved in this would be a game changer for uh, encouraging Republicans to take the vaccine. Do you guys agree and does President Biden want to see Trump get involved in this messaging? Well, if, if 
former President Trump woke up tomorrow and wanted to be more vocal about the sa safety and efficacy of the campaign, uh, of, the, of the vaccine, certainly we'd support that. Uh, but uh, also, I think what's important to note is that, as I noted, 81 percent of Republicans said they would trust their own doctor or health care provider, and that's an important place to invest. Every other living former president, or most of them, if not all of them, has participated in public campaigns. They did not need an engraved invitation to do so. So he may decide he should do that. If so, great. But there are a lot of different ways to engage, to reach out, to ensure that people of a range of political support and backing uh, know the vaccine is safe and, and, and uh, uh, safe and effective. Go ahead, Numish. Thanks so much. First question is back on the border. There were lawyers who interviewed some children that were in facilities. The children described sleeping on the floor, being hungry, not being, not seeing the sun for days. How is that acceptable for the Biden administration to keep children in those sorts of conditions, given the fact that you said you, you were an administration that was going to be more humane than the previous one? Well, these, let me first say this is, um, heartbreaking. Uh, it's a very emotional issue for a lot of people, um, and it's very difficult and challenging. And obviously, these TBP facilities are not made for kids. So one of the reasons, uh, or a driving reason why, uh, the president has pushed to take all of the actions that I outlined earlier when Phil asked the question is because we want to expedite getting these kids out of these CBP facilities as quickly as possible. And that's our goal and our objective, and into shelters as quickly as possible, then into sponsored homes while their cases are being considered and adjudicated. Uh, we are trying to work through what was a dismantled and unprepared system because of the, the, F, the role of the last administration. It's going to take some time, but we are very clear-eyed about what the problems are and very focused on uh, putting forward solutions. And I understand the idea of these facilities not being designed by children, but children being hungry, sleeping on the floor, not being allowed outside for days at a time. Why is that acceptable to go on even for one more day? Why is that something that's not being outlawed right now? How is the administration not stopping that today? Well, Yamisha, it's not acceptable. But I think the challenge here is that there are only there are not that many options. So the options are, and we have a lot of critics, but many of them are not putting forward a lot of solutions. The options here are send the kids back on the journey, send them to unvetted homes, or work to expedite moving them into shelters where they can get uh, health uh, treatment by medical doctors, by, uh, by educational resources, legal counseling, mental health counseling. That's exactly what we're focused on doing. And this is an across the administration effort that we are committed from the top to making changes on as quickly as possible. You just talked about vaccine hesitancy. I know you said that there are going to be resources for Dr. Fauci and others in, in the mm -hmm. administration to go out and reach out to trusted sources. Based on polling and conversations with the experts, the government is not the answer for reaching a lot of the GOP men in particular that were found to be hesitant of the vaccine. Is it a waste of time to have those officials go there? And are there other things that the government should be doing that maybe are different than having the face of the people that many of these voters don't trust being the ones talking to them? I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I think I just answered this exact question um, earlier with some of the specific steps we're taking and examples of people we're putting forward and our efforts to empower, support local medical doctors, experts who are very powerful and impactful um, voices in a range of communities. So that's exactly what we're doing. And I could not agree with you more. We agree with you, you know, that it's not, we are not always the right voice. Uh, the Biden administration or somebody standing at this podium to a range of conservative communities. And we have to meet people where they are, which is why we're taking a number of approaches and using a number of tactics. Of black leaders, some black experts saying that there was too much focus on the hesitancy in the African-American community, and that might be used as an excuse for not having enough access to black, to black people in this country, that this administration and others focus too much on black people and their hesitancy for the vaccine. I may not be understanding your question. We're not providing. I would say this, law, leaders say that Black black people's hesitancy to the vaccine mm -hmm. might be used as an excuse for low vaccination rates as well as access to the vaccine. So there are some that are saying when you talk too much about African American people and their hesitation to the vaccine, that that then becomes an excuse. That those are the the arguments that African American leaders and others are making right now. An excuse within the community or an excuse for us? Yeah, an excuse for the administration and others to say black people aren't getting vaccinated at higher rates because they're hesitant. 
I would say that we, we, we just look at the data. Our objective is to ensure that all American adults have access to the vaccine, are vaccinated, and that we are doing everything we can to reach communities and people where they are. So that is, the, our approach has been based on the data and the statistics we were looking at. We have taken a number of steps, including uh, putting forward, uh, supporting more community health centers. Now there are 900 mobile clinics to get into communities, mass vaccination sites to ensure that the vaccine is accessible and in a range of communities where we did through data see hesitancy. So I would just refute that. I don't think that's an accurate uh, a, a description of our approach. I know we have to wrap this up here because I think you guys have to gather for the event. But well, just while you were up here, there's some news uh, out of Dallas at yeah. CBP uh, and, and FEMA are setting up a detention center at the convention center that can house 300 migrant children, 3,000 uh, three, 3, migrant immigrant, uh, uh, immigrant teenagers. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with the administration's val stated values and how, what protections in, uh, uh, are being put in place in that facility to make sure that these, these teenagers are cared for? Well, I'd have to look at the specific report. I would say that we have been looking at uh, additional facilities to open, to move children, uh, un unaccompanied children, uh, into mm -hmm. facilities where they can receive access to health care, educational resources, mental health resources, legal resources. Uh, and certainly, we would ensure that um, we are meeting the standard that we have set out. Uh, but I'd have to check into those specific reports since they happened while we were up here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.